English language. Are you a language teacher? And uh, what do you hope to um, get out of this webinar today? Hi, my name's Patricia Bernhard and I am in Philadelphia. I am teaching a family, uh, predominantly the mother of an Afghan refugee family and the, also the little children. I'm teaching them English, um, but I wanna move into teaching more math. Um, the mother is illiterate even in her home language. Awesome. I'm just kind of looking too here at the, the chat. I have, I see I have a lot of people, some names that I do recognize. I so see English language teachers. I see some math teachers. And I see some of both. Okay, awesome. Okay, so again, as you were told, this is cultivating mathematical literacy for English language learners. And my name is Cindy Schultz and I'm teaching in the St. Cloud area. I teach for the St. Cloud area school district and we are part of the Central Minnesota ABE. Um, I consider myself a math teacher. I come from the higher education world. I was a math professor for more than 20 years, but I've made a nice transition to teaching adult basic education now. And now that I find myself teaching numeracy, I also find myself in the role of teaching uh, language as well. And I am Megan Himes. Um, thanks for joining us today. I am currently a program supervisor at Blaine Learning Lab, um, which is part of Metro North Consortium. And um, I have been an ABE teacher for a long time, mainly in one room schoolhouse correctional environments, um, <clears throat> but um, sort of teaching the whole, uh, the whole spectrum. Um, and then yes, more recently have moved into this role of supervisor. So, and I'll be talking more from an administrative perspective today. Okay. Um, so the objectives for today are, um, as you can see here, basically, Right, talking about the value of numeracy in the classroom, um, talking just a little bit about how that aligns with standards, um, and um, hoping that you get some ideas to take away um, for adding numeracy into the ELL classrooms, um, and then having some actual experience with some routines and activities um, related to numeracy. Um, just briefly, right, the CCRS is uh, huge, um, but the top part are uh, math some, a few math practices. Um, the bottom section um, is highlighting uh, where those uh, correlate with the ELA standards. Um, overall, as you can see, right, so making sense of problems and persevering, um, and that goes along with complexity. As students are learning in ELA, we're trying to always increase that complexity. It's increasing that perseverance for them. Um, explaining and justifying your work is a part of math standards and using evidence as a part of ELA standards and those overlap. Um, and then looking for ways to use structure, um, which is also as far as ELA, um, you know, continuing to build that knowledge. So. Um, ELL, numeracy in the ELL classrooms is absolutely aligned. Um, the goal for the ELL students, right, is to move up um, into the CCRS, and um, this also aligns with the ELL standards. Okay, so I teach a, what I would call a standalone numeracy class, um, as I, but I understand that many of you are going to be looking at how to add numeracy to your English classroom. But just a little bit about <clears throat> where my numeracy class came from. Um, sometime back, I was asked, could I teach a basic 
math class. Can you teach the students how to add, subtract, multiply, divide? And so I'm like, oh yeah, fine. And um, well, I quickly figured out that they already knew how to add, subtract, multiply and divide. So, and I thought I gotta make this class more rigorous. I need to make this class um, more in depth. So I started adding in concepts from numeracy. So the class still focuses on adding, subtract, multiplying and dividing but we do a lot more with representation of data. So we look at pictographs, we, students learn how to read bar graphs, <clears throat> tables. We do a lot of reading and writing. My students told me that we wanna do more reading. Okay, we can do that. We wanna do more writing. Okay, we can do that. Uh, we focus on communication. Students are talking about the math that they're doing. We talk about modeling. How do we represent this with a mathematical equation? Um, we talk about relationships. What's the relationship between um, math, um, multiply and divide? What's the relationship between add and subtract? Um, we focus on problem solving and we focus on um, critical thinking. <clears throat> um, so just for a moment, I'm going to um, talk at you all about um, from moving from a teacher to an administrative position and from an administrative position, um, how I um, support numeracy in the ELL classrooms and why um, why it's important. Um, so on the left-hand side of the screen, I put a little quote up there um, from a poem some of you may be familiar with. Um, but I just wanted to quickly show, so um, it also doesn't have to be, <clears throat> and so Cindy, um, you know, is talking about all the different ways that she's incorporated um, things into the, her classroom. Um, and it can also be, right, even talking about communication, it can also be something as simple as presenting, um, you know, presenting a little poem. So I have a teacher here who once a week for during numeracy time, um, either brings in like a poem or a quote um, and uses the language um, and then asks students to talk about it. What do you think about this? What do you see here? Um, and it gets them building their language, um, but it doesn't have to be right this massive like, oh, we're going to start teaching calculus to everybody, um, right? Numeracy, that's not thats not what is necessary. Um, so as I said earlier, it is standards aligned. Um, it also incorporates ACEs and TIFF, um, which is part of the ABE world. Um, how I support it as a program administrator is that it's required in all classes here at Blaine. So every class has to incorporate numeracy. Um, and one way that we also help that is that here um, we structure it so that all classes offer numeracy at the same time every day. We have a break every morning and right after break, every class offers numeracy, um, which also then allows us um, to, if there are students who maybe have moved beyond what's being in one class, we can move the students around. So it also helps us with groupings. Um, but another way that um, we have, you know, played with and that I've heard other sites use is using a certain percentage of time in class per week um, or that it's always offered on certain days. So maybe if your class is, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday or whatever your schedule may be, um, every Wednesday is uh, for numeracy or part of every Wednesday. Um, but just basically making sure that there it is built into the structure of your programming. Um, and then also supporting the staff with professional development. Um, teachers themselves might also need to build some numeracy numeracy skills. Um, this might be unfamiliar to some teachers, or they might have some anxiety around this. Um, so just making sure that to support staff um, and, and or if you are a staff person asking for that support um, or asking your administrators to reach out to me, I'm perfectly fine with that too. Um, but um, another way that we incorporate it here is um, utilizing staff meeting time to introduce some of these things. So I will use a portion of staff meeting time to introduce a little routine that teachers can pick up and use um, as a way to also help alleviate, like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. Um, but no matter what, um, all students deserve uh, quality numeracy instruction. And um, so it really should be in, in every class. And so we appreciate you joining us today to hear about how you might be able to do that. 
Okay, so my students are all English language learners. Um, they are at a level three or a level four in their English. Um, higher students are welcome. So our, link, our levels five and six, but generally when a student gets to level five in their English, um, then they start on the pre-diploma math. So primarily I'm gonna be seeing levels um, three and four. And so here's the biggest question I think that, that gets asked is well, how do I do this? Where do I get the content? Because that was my biggest challenge when I first started evolving this class. And I looked for books and the books were either just too simplistic, just workbooks of, okay, students sit down and do 30 um, double digit editions now do 30 double edition, um, double digit edition with a carry and just just arithmetic, just too, too simple. Or if I looked at something that was said to be a numeracy book, um, the language was levels were too high or it simply wasn't what I was focused on. So I have been um, creating my own materials and I'm gonna show you that in a little bit. Um, I do look and search for infographics that I can find online. Um, I started using um, some books by Steve Jenkins that I'm very um, fond of. So those are ones that I'd have you look at, um, at at another time. I am gonna be showing you something from Animals by the Numbers that um, I have used. And then I do use some routines that I have found online, such as uh, mobile math and some es estimation routines. Okay. So um, every day I have a uh, number of the day worksheets and where these came from is, my class starts at 8.30 but that means that students are gonna be coming in anytime between 8.30 and nine o'clock. So I need to have something for the students to work on while we were waiting for everybody to um, come to class. And the students were also telling me that, oh, we wanna do more reading and we want to do more writing. So I thought, okay, how can I incorporate every day that they're reading every day that they're writing. So I came up with these number by the day worksheets. Um, the numbers are random. So um, students try to figure out a pattern. There is no pattern, it's, it's just random. But what I have found by using these number of the day worksheets is that they're supporting my um, ELL um, in their English classes. So for example, if we take the um, the bird problem. So I'll have students read the problem. Um, after we've all come together, they've worked on this for a while. Then we talk about it as a class. So I have, so well, I'll do the same thing with you. Um, there were 35 birds in a tree. 10 birds joined them. How many birds are now in the tree? So what I want you to do is you can do it in the chat. As you can tell me the mathematical equation that will answer that question. And I want you to tell me what is the vocabulary that told you to use that mathematical operation. So we have them saying addition, joined equals addition. Mm -hmm. Yep. 35 plus 10 equals 45 and joined, joined them. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I was able to pull up the chat. So I'm looking at them and yeah, everybody is agreeing that it is the word joined because I try very hard to not use the words like we're 10 birds were added to the tree. I tried to avoid using any words that will tell them what the operation is because I don't want my students to start to just say, look for words like add 
or subtract. Um, so somebody says, but they're birds. So I'm guessing some of the birds will fly off. Yeah, some will come. And that's a whole nother problem actually, because the next day the question will probably say um, 10 birds flew away. And so then it's a subtraction problem. Um, but yeah, it does, it, it brings up a lot of conversation and how this one, the, I remember this one, the conversation that it brought up about language is one of my students asked 35 birds in a tree or 35 birds on a tree. So that brought up the whole talk about, well, why would it be in a tree? What would it look like if they were on the tree? So we can spend a lot of time on a problem like this, just, just breaking down the, the conversation of the problem. And then what the students do is they'll write a complete sentence um, to answer the question. So they could say, there are now 45 birds in the tree. Okay, so then they practice their writing. Um, I want you to look at the question about the sisters. You have $35. You and your sister will share the money equally. How much does each person receive? So again, the idea is what is the mathematical sentence or equation that you would write? And what are some of the key vocabulary? And put that in the chat, please. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so Candace is saying divide each, uh, William, division equally, but you could also say multiplication if you multiply by five. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Danelle, divide by two to get equal parts. Uh, Joanne, $35 divided by two, so share equally. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yes, that's lots of division, share equally. Yeah, and that's the idea of, of the idea of sharing taking a larger amount and putting it into smaller amounts. And we would discuss in class why the word equally is in there. Because in division, we have to have the equal amounts in each group. But this brings up more conversation about if the word equally isn't there, would this change the problem? Possibly because you can share money and two people don't get the same amount. And we discussed in that one, why, why would one person get more money than the other person? So I like them because it generates some, um, what I would consider spontaneous conversation. And I, I think I saw somebody had a chat in the chat that said about, there were questions so that everybody could get something, right? Yeah. So like every day there's spelling. The students are very, very proud of their spelling. Or like this one, find two different numbers that make this true. There's many, many numbers that make that true. So that's another opportunity for there to be many, many right answers. Oh, there's a question. How does equal mean the same thing in math as in English? Why equally and not just equal? Yeah, these are questions that would be brought up too late. Like, why does that say we'll share the money equally versus share the money equal? Okay. So any questions about the number of the day or any more comments? So I have one of these for every day and they're pretty quick for me to, to um, make. Um, so then I talked about <clears throat> the, the, the book. Oh yeah, equally as an adverb, equal as an adjective. Yeah, so that's again, incorporating the idea with 
with what they know with their language. So I really like the, the Stephen Jenkins books and they're written for elementary school children and you can probably find them in your library. And he has a, he had wrote a series of um, by the numbers. So there's el animals by the numbers, there's universe by the numbers, day by the numbers, um, there's a, a half a dozen of them. And so what I would do is, if I were you, is I would just <clears throat> just um, go to your library and search for um, Steve Jenkins and look for the number series. And so I, this is the one thing that I did with my students. So um, they were shown this infographic about, and I just put it up there. I have the book, I bought the book. I liked it that much wanted my own copy. And so I will show them this graphic and just ask them, what do you see? And, you know, and they'll, they'll start talking about that. Oh, I see human, I see a dog, I see elephant, I see a cat. And then um, what do you, what else do you see? And they'll talk about sleep and, or they might say, wow, a brown bat really sleeps a long time. Or what's a brown bat? We have to look at that on the computer, on Google. And how I use this to support um, what the students are doing in their language classes is best seen if you go to the Jamboard. Okay. So what I did, let me just look at the jam board is, okay, here's the, the infographic again, is I had this, I gave the students each half of a question. So on slide two, so some of the students would get half the question, a human sleeps, and then somebody else had the other half of the question, like eight hours per day, 20 hours per day. So we'd, they'd have to look at the graphic. So I, if they have a human sleeps, look at the graphic, eight hours per day. And then they would have to find the other person that had the other half. So they'd have to find the person that found that had eight hours per day. I just wrote them on little slips of paper, but you can see in the jam, you can do it on a jam board. Just pull it over. Okay. So what would be the one for a squirrel? What would be the squirrel one. 15 hours a day. Okay. So that's a simple exercise that, yeah, you can do it online or you can do it in person. Yeah, so it's a very simple one. And what I'd have the students do is in class and they just come up and put the two halves together under the document camera. So this is a nice one. And then they had a good time with this one. Um, I also had something like this, but I cut them up into little pieces of, a little pieces of paper, but you can see this one. Um, like a cat, they'd have to rearrange all the words. So a cat sleeps 13 hours each day, okay? And so I'd have the students come up, put their words underneath the document camera. And if necessary, the students will help each other to put them in the right order. And what I think these infographics lend themselves well, though, is for comparisons. So if we look at the blue, you can see that I am comparing a brown bat and a python. So if I have a brown bat, 20, python, 18, so a brown, so I have to put brown bat first because it's more, right? 20, a brown bat sleeps 
more hours. Now, is it than or as, right? Than a Python. So I find, yeah, if you're doing comparisons, I think that the Jenkins books lend themselves really well for <clears throat> support for their, their grammar. And, or a simpler one is, again, you could do the half a sentence. Each student has half a sentence. So a cat sleeps more hours than, well, let's see who could a cat sleep more hours than. sleeps more hours than a human, a dog. Oh, nice. And William just um, put in the chat too that Desmos might be a really great tool to do this if you're teaching online. Um, oh, because yeah. then, yeah, because then each student, right, could have their own space to do this in and then you could see what each student was doing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, or William, too, you could also assign each student their own Jamboard, um, so or their own page in the Jamboard, depending on how many students you have, and then they could each use their own page um, to, to do it so you can see what they're doing. But yeah, thank you for that. Desmos is a really great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I teach my students in a face-to-face classrooms so yeah so mine are easy to just type them up and cut them up so yeah but yeah that's most would work great for for online for your online students yeah so and these again what my students when we did our comparisons you know we'd have to think about like well which which word comes first if a cat sleeps more hours than a human so the cat has to be first in the sentence but if it's fewer, then the cat has to be, um, whoever has less hours has to be first in the sentence. And also we talk about things like fewer, fewest, who sleeps the fewest hours, who sleeps the most hours. So we get a lot of grammar, a lot of language out of these problems. So any comments or questions? All right. Okay. So what I want you to do is I use this infographic with my numeracy students and I want to show it to you. So life expectancy of 50 animals. I spend a lot of time going online and searching for things. And so I found this one that I thought was really, really interesting. And there's a lot of information on here. There's, you know, you have all the animals, then you have the genus species of all animals. You have the, I'm not exactly sure if it'd be the family or the, or the group or whatever, but you have like the mammals, the amphibians, the reptiles. But what I found with this is my students could focus though on the key elements. And so even though it was really busy, they were able to find the details that they needed to. So what I'd like you to do is we're gonna put you in breakout rooms. And I'd like you to brainstorm in your breakout rooms as to what type of questions you might wanna ask your students for this infographic, uh, what types of discussion, you uh, could see coming out of this infographic and then put in the Jamboard, which you should have the link for, or it should be coming soon um, on page um, six of the Jamboard. All right, so I have the breakout rooms ready. Uh, so you'll have about five minutes um, to think through uh, a couple questions. How would you foster conversations? Uh, what kind of discussions would you have with your students about this infographic? So I will start those and we'll see you back here shortly.
Okay, we're all coming back. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm I'm looking at the Jamboard and if people want, if people can, if they want to keep adding ideas to the Jamboard, that would be awesome. <laughs> I see all, I see some more coming. So I see things like comparing which groups have the longest lifespans. What do you notice and wonder? Yeah. What do the colors mean? These are questions I haven't even thought of. Um, how do they calculate average lifespan? That would be good. What does ranking mean? Which animals live more than 50 years? Where are the humans? They're on there. They're farther down. Yeah. If the graphic is too big, it won't fit on, um, it won't all fit. You have to scroll down. Um, what is the graphic measuring and how do you read it? Yeah, we had to spend time with my students tracing and the students actually went up to the TV where I was projecting it so that they could physically move along it. Does size have anything relevance? Mm -hmm. Where are the humans? A question to ask and check for understanding. Yep. Yeah. So one of the things that came up in our discussion was, I think if you scroll down, humans have an average lifespan of 76 years, something like that. Then it was, well, does that mean that all humans live 76 years? No, but some live more, some live longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of some of the different things that students commented on. And sometimes they just talked about, well, what are these animals? You know, what's an alligator? Oh, interesting conversation. Alligator versus crocodile. You know, so we looked at pictures and um, like grizzly bears. Do we have grizzly bears in Minnesota? It's like, hope not, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so, the, so I find that the infographics, in addition to just, um, you know, doing things like, oh, who lives longer, who lives shorter, which are awesome questions, they also generate a lot of just spontaneous conversation. So... I've spent also a lot of time on um, trying to find routines that um, get the students um, critically thinking. And I find these sometimes just by basically Googling, and then I go to the Adult Numeracy Network, which is linked on the one of the final um, slides. But I found these mobile math um, problems. And so what I would like everybody to do is I've got it projected to you. And what you're going to figure out is how much does the green heart weigh? How much does the orange square weigh? And how much does the crescent moon weigh? Each one of those. So I don't want you to just put the answers right away in chat. I want you, you can type them in chat. Don't hit enter because we're going to do a waterfall. So how much does the green heart equal? How much does the orange square weigh? And how much does the crescent moon weigh? Okay. And I'll do it too while I'm waiting.
And we'll do about four more minutes. So if you need a break, you can take that too. I will do one more minute. Okay, so in the chat, can you just tell me if you think you've solved it or you want more time? So, Megan, is there any... Megan, I, can you turn your mic on? Sorry, thank you. I, I can't see the chat. People... So yeah, no. So yep. So um, so a couple of people have said they got it, and um, one person said yes, they have an answer, but thanks for the time because they needed it. Mm -hmm. Um, one person started to put their let's answers in, that. but don't. Let's hold up on that right now. <clears throat> So yeah, so a few people are coming in saying they think they got it. So a few people are thinking they got it. Okay. The question I have is, because again, I'm not, I, I don't see the chat right now with my screen. Um, do people want more time? Nobody has said that yet. Okay. So, if you would like more time, say so now. Because normally it takes more than, with my students, it takes more than five minutes to do these. 
Nobody's asking for more Nobody time? Nobody is asking for okay. more time. So in the, now we're going to do the waterfall where you um, put in your answer. So heart equals, square equals, moon equals, but don't hit enter yet. I think everybody got their answers. Now hit enter and I want, and then we'll see what people have. Woo, look at that waterfall. Okay. <laughs> so what are people getting? Okay, so we've got um, a few different things here. So mm -hmm. um, let's see. So we have a square nine moon two heart six, um, okay. moon eight, heart six square six okay um this one is heart six square six moon eight okay. uh this one is moon eight and then square and heart six so similar um let's see heart 12 um moon eight and then square six okay um square six heart six moon eight I'm trying to see if i can scroll down fast enough to see so there's some more heart square six moon eight um mm -hmm. and oh yeah so pretty patsy i agree i love it when all the answers flood yes so we're yes. seeing the majority is heart is six square is six and the moon is eight and this is a nice exercise too for your shapes. You know, oh, what is that? That's a square, that's a heart, that's a crescent moon. Okay, so yes, I also have the heart is six, the square is six, and the moon is eight. Now I will tell you, and this is my advice to you, is um, when my students first start um, looking at, a puzzle, they discuss it in their L1. So whatever language that they want. So most of my students are Somali. So at this time, you will hear a lot of Somali in the classroom. And I recommend that you that they do this um, in their L1 so that they can discuss that in without having the extra challenge of like, okay, how am I going to say this in English? And I had a lot of discussion. It is really amazing. So what I then do after, um, it seems like we've come to a consensus and I can generally tell because I know a little bit of Somali, a little bit of Spanish. I know my numbers. So when I hear somebody saying, Lich, that's six. Um, and I'll hear, or, um, I hear um, ha, which means yes, or you could tell by the body language. Um, then I will ask a student to explain to the class. Now this needs to be in English um, because we're now a whole class. So what I like to do is have a volunteer now who, who could um, explain how you um, came up with the heart is six, the square is six and the Crescent moon is eight. So a volunteer who wants to come on and explain it. Does somebody want to unmute and explain how they came to their answer? I will. Awesome. Okay, we've got 72. We've got three equal uh, lines. So we're going to divide 72 by three. We come up with 24. So the moon is the easiest. You just take that 24 and divide it by three again, because there's three moons and that comes up with eight. The first two lines are equal in weight and they both have four objects in it. So that means the heart and the squares weigh the same because there's four in each. And so we take the 24 divided by four and we come up with six mm -hmm. for both of those. Yeah. Thank you, Patricia. You're welcome.
Is there anybody who had a um, slightly different way of doing it? Because I do encourage multiple ways of doing things. Um, sure, I can. Mine was a little bit different. It was similar. I also mm -hmm. divided 72 by three and got 24. Mm -hmm. And I figured out about the moons. And then I then I just looked in the center as I was there for, um, there are four squares. So 24 divided by four is six. And then I didn't quite figure out as quickly that, you know, that with four four equal things in the other one, that it would be the same. And I thought, well, if the squares are six, then two squares is 12. So then I need the two hearts will add up to 12 and half of 12 is six. It's like, oh, okay, they're the same. I was expecting them to be different, but they, they were not. I did it the same way. I didn't, it, it didn't dawn on me right away either. That. But I did use that idea to check it. I mean, I used what what, yeah. what Patricia said as a, like, wait a minute, does that really make sense? Because mm -hmm. I questioned, would they be the same? So then I did kind of go back like, well, so I kind of came out the other way too. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Liddy. Yeah. So that's the other thing is, is what I like about these is you've got them doing the problem solving. Because when students first start to do these, it is not obvious how you're supposed to do it. And there is a struggle and they tell me, oh, these are hard. They're fun. They do tell me that too. And um, so there is that problem solving, but then there is that aspect of they have to be able to explain it. And um, so they get a more opportunity. And again, that spontaneous um, discussions. And these are easy to do because people have created a lot of them. You have to make sure though that you look at them in advance because um, there are some where the shapes have uh, decimal values or the shapes have fractions and you may or may not want that for your students. So, um, and that's a great lead in actually, Cindy. So there's a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, yeah. So one from Mike, Mike was saying, you know, what were you thinking about? Shouldn't the shapes um, have different numbers? Um, mm -hmm. And I think you're kind of touching on that now. Yep. Um, which also then brings up, um, Rebecca made a comment about, it's a great opportunity to have a conversation about balance, right? Yes. Seeing that the hearts and the squares are in the same um in the same line. So does that mean that they weigh the same or what does, or how do they balance out? What does that mean? Yes, we talk about, um, or like I didn't tell you what 72 was, but that was the total weight. So, but then they think of, my students think of that not as a mobile, like, you know, you hang above the babies. They thought of it more as a scale, like. Yeah, I think that sounds like what some of the people here were thinking too. Um, and then Cynthia um, Bell posed a question um, asking, so I'm curious if this level of algebraic thinking is normal or expected for an ELL class? My students could do it. <laughs> they, I think it's normal. I find that my students have very good problem solving skills. Um, I'm of the opinion that... Um, Try it, see what happens. I've done some things with my students. So I thought, no, nope, no, nope, we're not doing that again. That didn't go so well. Well, we got to make some changes. But absolutely, I've this is algebraic thinking, but I find that my students who had a very abbreviated education because um, of being in refugee camps, they could do this from the get go. So you don't have, um, so yeah, this level of algebraic thinking I find is very accessible to English language learners, yes. Yeah, and what I can say here, at least what we've experienced here at my site is that um, <laughs> with students, again, depending on their um, their background and, and schooling, um, I think that they might not always have the language um, mm -hmm. to explain Right. They might not always have the English. I should say they might not always have the English language to explain their answer. Um, but um, but 
based on numeracy or mathematical thinking, they are able to figure it out and get there, um, which is why I also think, I think it's great to have them discuss it in their L1 first, yes. Um, yes. you know, and then help build the language um, so that they can also explain it, right? That's the goal is to have help them build that English language around it. Right, yes. And the, the amount of work, the amount of discussion, even though I don't speak Somali, I can see the amount of discussion on these problems is, is just amazing. And you can hear them debating each other. Ha, yes, Maya, no, you know, so they're having discussions. So I've had really good success with the mobile math. And then I want us to play a game that I do with my class. Thursdays are Thursday fun days and we play games. And so we do a game where I found some routines online and I kind of tweaked them a little bit. So there's three container estimations. So you're all gonna participate. So these are by Steve Wyberney. And so you can go, um, there's a link at the end. So I turned this into this game. So the first thing that I want people to do in, in, is how, what is the total number of objects? So don't, don't type it, don't hit enter, but you'll type in your total number of objects and you'll wait for me to tell you when to do the waterfall. So that's just the first question. Total number, all three containers together. No, 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 no. Okay, right. All right, so go ahead and in the chat, if you have your number in, go ahead and hit enter and we're gonna look at what numbers we got coming through. Uh, 52, 35, 55, 48, 59, 44, 60, 58, 52, 55, 42. Oh, okay, so we're hearing a lot of variety, right? Yes, we are. Okay. 60. <laughs> Ooh, okay. So what I do with my students is because I don't have is I have like, you know, a dozen of them. So I just I just write on the board every and I everybody's guess or it's not a, actually it's not a guess because they you can see them like they're kind of reasoning it out. Okay. So the total I reveal the total is 54. Okay, so give yourself a point if you got 54. Now in my case, we, whoever is the closest gets a point. So we then we have 55. So whoever 55 to is Deanne, 55. So yes. that person gets. Oh, and so did Liddy. Liddy said 55. Okay. So, cause nobody said 54. Okay. Uh, no. So then you get a point. Okay. Mark, give yourself a point. I would mark on the board. Okay. So now what you're going to do is you're, you now know that there are 54 objects. You are going to, and you want to write them on a piece of paper, you are going to figure out how many, do an estimation of how many is in cup one, two, three, as we read left to right, how many in cup one, how many in cup two, how many in cup three. And you know there's 54 of them.
So what I want you to do is in the chat, just put cup one. Just cup one. Don't hit enter yet. Okay, now go ahead and hit enter and we'll do a waterfall. All right, we've got... <clears throat> 18, 12, 16, 20, um, multiple 18s, 20. So 18 and 20 for the majority, majority. and then outliers are 12 and 16. Mm -hmm. See, what I like about this is um, I actually have, I actually record where the students will tell me cup one, cup two, cup three. And then somebody will say, well, no, no, that doesn't add up to 54. And then they have to adjust. And so you have to kind of start thinking about, okay, well, what numbers add up to 54 and which is the bigger one? And there's a lot of critical thinking. So I'm going to reveal cup one, 18. Okay. Ooh, so winner, winner. Who got, so somebody got 18. Multiple people had 18, so yes. you get a point, okay? So give yourself a point. You have to keep your own score, okay? Now, what I do with my students is they now have the opportunity, if they want, to change their answers for cups two and three. So you kind of have to think about it. It's like, well, wait, was I over? Then I'll have to adjust which direction or my under so you see how you kind of yeah it's fun so you if you want to you can adjust cups two and three so I, I was off by four so i have to adjust by four <laughs> Okay, so what I want you to do in the chat is put in your cups two and three. And we'll wait for everybody to do that. Oh, well, thanks, Cynthia, for coming. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, so we've got we'll one so far for cups two and three. Oh, here we go. Okay. Oh, well, yep, waterfall. <clears throat> Um, so we've got cup two, uh, so cup two is like 22, 20, lots of 22s, some 21s, mostly 22, and then there's 18, 21, and 20. Mm -hmm. Cup three is 14, 14, 16, 14, 14, 15, 14, 17, 18, mm -hmm. mostly 14s. Yeah. So I'm going to reveal it. So cup two had 23. So if you got cup two right, then you would have gotten cup three right with 13. So give yourself. So basically then what I Yay. do is who, whoever was the closest on cup two would get a point. So Patricia answered 23 and 13. So she would get two points. Yep. And then at the end, who's ever got the most points wins. And how I use um, when with games like this, I have uh, my colleague gave me a bunch of these punch cards. And so a student gets a punch card for attendance but they get an extra punch on their punch card for winning a game. And then when they get their punch card all filled out, then they can they get a prize 
and I have prizes that are like little erasers, pencils, basically school supplies. And so the students, they really love this because they like games. We all do. Yeah. And, you know, you can, ex now I think the, I turned it into a game, but the intent is, is if you don't do a game, you could do discussion like, well, why does, um, how did you know that there were, how did you figure out how many was in cup one? Or how many is in cup two? So it could be all kinds of discussions. But Wyborny has a lot of things on, um, they have three, this is the one that I like the most, the three container, but there's clipboard estimations. And there's lots of things. Well, and I think too, another way you could look at this is even starting with asking the students, if I told you how many objects there were, mm -hmm. how might you figure out what was in each cup, right? Just thinking okay. through the process of it without the pressure of having to figure it out, yep. but asking them like, how how might you figure this out? Um, what, what type of um, planning or process might you use? Because mm -hmm. that might also bring up things Carol said in the chat that, um, so to Carol, the cups look different in width at the bottom mm -hmm. um, and oh. at the top and at the bottom, right? So mm -hmm. which may have, you know, change the way that Carol was thinking about what could fit in there. Um, I never noticed that. Or volume. Yeah, I see it too. He's the middle right. one. Yeah. Oh, right. And so, um, so I just think too, that can bring up, right. Again, this can, the conversation, um, and especially with vocabulary building, even describing, oh, some cups look smaller or wider or taller. Mm -hmm. Um, so yep. thank you, Carol. Yes, for sharing that. Yeah, that is really, I, it's like I said, I never observed that, but yeah, all kinds, they asked me too, what are those things in there? Sprockets? I think they're sprockets. What's a sprocket? You know, so it, it really, it does help. It helps them to, again, just have these conversations. Okay. And I'm curious, is anybody willing to share? Oh, sorry, Cindy, before you jump ahead, I was just curious if anybody, I was just wondering how people felt about the like adjustment, like being allowed to adjust. Did that, did you feel like that helped you rethink or did you feel like that put more pressure? Like, oh, I didn't get that first one right. Now I've got to scramble. Anybody willing to share how the allowing you that time to make that adjustment if you knew you didn't get the first one right. Well, thanks. So Kristen is saying adjusting is a great way to include everyone. Mike said he liked having a second chance. Um, oh yes. Yeah. so Rebecca says adjustments are a great way to reassess, great life skill. Um, Carol says adjustment to me was a clue the cups were equal. Oh, but they weren't. Ah, mm. and then, um, yes, and Patsy uh, really liked, um, especially for ELL learners, um, allowing for lots of language and natural conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So thank you guys for sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are All great right. ideas. Yeah, my students are very receptive to the idea of getting to adjust because in life, yeah, we're not always going to get it quite right. And they go, okay, how are you going to have to adjust this a little bit? Right? Nope. Okay. So as I said, um, I find a lot of things by um, just looking for stuff. So these are some places that I would like you to go to at your leisure to look for. I've used Splat Math. That's a whole series of routines. Um and take a look at that. The which one doesn't belong? That is another one that um, I know people use, and that is one where um, I can show you. Um, it op it's a nice way to to open up discussion. You know, I usually start with the with the ones that are the like the shapes. You know, which one doesn't belong? Um, the coins, I've used the coins. 
um, slow reveal graphs. Again, I'll have people can look at this at their leisure, but slow reveal, reveal graphs are another awesome resource. And then if you haven't looked at the adult numeracy network instructional routines, um, I think that'd be a nice place because that's where I go to get, get a lot of ideas for helping the students. Okay, so at this point, if you have any questions for either myself or Megan, I'd be happy to, to entertain those. Ask away, we are running ahead of schedule here, so yes, we, are. we have time. Um, can I ask my question, not typing in the chat? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I have a question about how you use the the math everyday worksheets. And do you do students do the whole thing and you talk about the whole thing every day? And how long is that? Does that take? And yeah. did you make did you make all of those yourself or did you find them somewhere and then you modified? Okay, thank so um number of the day is not, you know, a unique idea. Other people have done it. I make my own worksheets. I have a template, so it's really fast for, I use Word, it's really fast for me to, to make these. Um, how they're used is, I kind of think about, okay, what do I want the students to be working on right now? At that, when we did this one, we were doing a lot of adding and subtracting. So I think about, okay, how, what am I gonna do to model addition, subtraction, incorporate vocabulary, some critical thinking. The students know the routine. They come into the classroom. The first student, generally, she arrives at 8.30. She'll, they grab, she'll grab this and she'll just start working on it. As the students filter in, they just pick this up and they just start working on it without any instruction from me. Um, they talk to each other. And when they talk about these, they talk about it in their L1. And then at nine o'clock, so it's, um, because remember, my students come anytime between 8.30 and nine o'clock. So at, at approximately nine o'clock, then we go through these um, one at a time. And probably about 20 minutes, I, I, it depends on the day. But I can spend a lot of time asking them questions such as, um, you know, why is this adding? What does it mean equally? Or they might have vocabulary that they need me to help them with, um, such as tax. What's tax? Um, so again, and I, that's how I've been using them. And yeah, I make them. I've got a big, big packet of them by now. Great. That's Bye. helpful. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and Liddy, just to add on to that. <clears throat> so I, I use number of the day um, in the classroom and, um, but because I was in one room schoolhouse, which might apply to many of you um, is um, I actually had um, an A and a B and actually I named them different things, but we'll just say A and B for um, this purpose. And um, depending on, cause I had students at different levels um, so students would, one group might do the A and one group might do the B. Um, and then I would take different times during class to meet with that group who did this one and that group who did this one. Um, or I've also done it where I had something like this, a whole sheet, but we just did one every morning. So we did one. So one was, it was like, you know, there was five on the sheet for five days and we came in and we did the one for Monday and then we would talk about it and then the one for Tuesday and so on. So just some variations there. Ah, oh, yes, Lindy, Lindsay is asking, what are your takeaways from today? Ooh. Um, so yes, Kristen is saying, I think I could incorporate the number of the day worksheet uh, with an mm -hmm. English lesson, knowing that they come from mixed level math classes, um, because students can pick up which level of math question to answer depending on their math level. Yes, exactly. Um, 
And, uh, oh, Mike is asking, is winning prizes okay with strict uh, Muslim students? Yes, I asked them because it's not gambling. They didn't give any money. But I did ask that in advance. And it's not gambling. So, yes, it is allowed. Uh, Catherine says um, they like the matching sentences and answer. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I like that one too, because if you're in person, students can get up and walk around and find their matcher. Yep. But it's awesome online too. Great questions, good takeaways. And yes, I and back to even what Kristen is saying, any of this is adaptable to your level and your students, um, right? This, what Cindy, a lot of what Cindy is going over today is what she's using in her specific classroom, um, but it's adaptable to whoever, whatever level you might be teaching. Yes, a lot of people um, like the matching sentences mm -hmm. and um, also appreciate the online resources to check out. Oh, so, good. <laughs> and yes, and Lydia is pondering the number of the day and the, likes the matching sentences too. Anybody else want to unmute and say anything or ask any questions? You don't have to put it in the chat. I will just come on. I'm coming at this with an ESL lens and years in a low level ESL classroom. And I'm just so struck by how language rich these activities are and just really appreciate um, all the, the language um, heavy and interesting stuff happening here, as well as the numeracy content, of course. So thank you so much for being brave and putting math and language in the same space for us. So thank you, Cindy, for helping us think about how that works. Um, and I know Liddy does a lot of this work as well. I see her agreeing as well. So, and I love the bravery of moving into algebraic thinking at low levels. Um, we do not have to wait for our students to reach some sort of threshold before we throw algebra at them. Um, I think there's a misconception around that. So I appreciate the normalizing of, of using algebraic thinking at all levels. Um, we don't have to have to wait to do that kind of thinking. So I appreciate that as well. So yeah, I just am excited about all the things that were shared here today. Um, as we move towards the close here, we're, um, there's some other things coming through the chat that I'll let you take a look at, but just a reminder that you will get the slides and all the things that were linked in the slides, um, of course, will be live. So you'll get those as well as the recording link as well um, in the next day or so in your email, as well as a link to um, an evaluation and a way to download your CEUs. So that will be coming from Gail Rutan at um, the Atlas office. So that will come your direction. Anything else you want to bring up from the chat? Oh, we've got Caroline who's bragging about Cindy. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate that always. <laughs> well, Cindy came on my radar, I don't know, a year or so ago, Cindy, and, and just I'm so pleased that you've stepped into presenting. So thank you. Oh, um, I wanted to answer the question Mike has. This is, I think, too, something about culture. Um, do you encourage students to use their calculators? I try to have them use their calculators. They don't want to. They want to do it by hand. And I think they told me that they are very proud of the fact that they can do the math by hand. That's so interesting. Huh? And um, yeah, so so I, certainly I encourage calculators, but um, my students don't want to use them. Which I, I I try to do what this I I want to do what the students need. student-centered learning at its best. Thank you. And and Liddy mentioned, if we don't name it as algebra, it's less scary. I have yes. to agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't tell them. Well, actually, I did tell my students it was algebra because algebra is an Arabic word. And so and they I, were very yeah. proud. And I think, too, when they're doing it, you say you were already doing it. And then it's less scary. It's like, oh, that's all it is? Oh, OK. Exactly. <laughs> right? oh. Exactly. Um, and I think too, sometimes we have built it up in our heads because perhaps we had negative experiences with it in middle school or high school. Um, well, thank you so much for your work today. If there are further comments and questions, we can keep those going. I am gonna turn off the recording at this point. So 